Well, I'm sure that almost all of you have heard of an award that's given out every year called the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, it's an award that's given typically to someone uh, in the world who is doing their part to, facilitator greater, to facilitate greater peace in the world. And while most of you have heard of the award, I'm also guessing that most of you don't know the background of how it came about, uh, because I certainly didn't. But there was a, a man named Alfred Nobel. Um, he was a Swedish chemist and inventor in the late 1800s. And the thing that he was most well known for was having a part in creating dynamite. And so Alfred Nobel became rich in helping to create a way to more easily destroy things and honestly also uh, to kill people. One day, Alfred Nobel was reading the newspaper. Remember those? And uh, he saw the headline. And the headline in the newspaper was this, the merchant of death is dead. That someone with the title, the merchant of death, had died. And Alfred Nobel reads the article and discovers that Alfred Nobel had passed away. Except he didn't because he was very much alive and reading the newspaper article. What had happened was that the reporter got something mixed up, heard a Nobel had died, and it happened to be Alfred's brother Ludwig Nobel, and had mistakenly thought that it was Alfred. And as Alfred read that article, he was able to recognize something that most of us will never have a chance. It's this, what you're going to be known for when you die. And as he was given in that article, the, the title of the merchant of death, it totally messed him up because it, it made him stop to pause and to think, is that what I want to be known for? If I had died... This is what people would remember me for, for creating dynamite and an easier way to kill people and destroy things, the merchant of death. And so you know what Alfred Nobel decided to do? He gave back millions of his dollars to start a foundation that would be all about creating peace in the world and eventually that would give out a prize or an award for someone who helps to facilitate greater peace in the world. Because that's what he wanted to be known for. And today, you probably, if you're like me, didn't know that he created dynamite. But you did know about the Nobel Peace Prize Award. And like I said, um, most of us are not going to have the opportunity to read our obituary in the paper before we die, right? But we can pause whatever age you're at. I don't care if you're a teenager or you're in your retirement years or somewhere in between. We can pause in whatever season or stage of life we're in and ask this question. What do I want to be known for? What is it that I want to give my life to? And maybe, maybe, maybe an even more important question, at least it's connected, are we spending our time in a way that's in line with our answer to that question? And, and there's probably more than one way to answer this question, because I think a lot of you are thinking about probably your, your family as you know, someone who loved their family, and that's a, an absolutely just great purpose or mission in life. But the thing is, we all have this desire to make our lives count, to, to do something that makes a difference. Not all of us want to be famous, maybe very few of us do, but we do want to do something that's important with our lives. And so often it's easy to find ourselves you know, getting into seasons where it feels like our life is just mundane that it's the same thing again and again, that we're just, you know, 
and find ourselves going through the motions even of life. What I want to tell you today and what I want you to hear and to really think about is this. That when we follow Jesus, when, when Jesus changes our lives and we recognize we have a God, we have a Savior, we have a future in heaven, what also comes along with that is a purpose that is so much greater than a big house and a new car and an early retirement. We have a purpose that truly, through our lives, that we can make a difference that, that lasts, well, forever. There's many places in the Bible we could turn to to talk about what that purpose is as it's shared with us. But one of my favorite is what Paul wrote to the Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, because it's just so clear. He first writes this in verse 15, that Jesus died for all, that, or with the result of, that those who live, that's you and me, should no longer live for themselves, but instead for him, Jesus, who died for them and was raised again. So we have a new person to live for, a new person that's Lord over our lives, and it's not us. And what does that look like? Well, skip ahead to verse 19, that God, oops, go back, has committed to us the message of reconciliation, there's this message he has given to us to, to share, a message of a relationship with God that's been changed or reconciled. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. If, if you are a Christian, if you follow Jesus, we have the name of Jesus in a very real way written on us. We are, we are the reflectors of who Jesus is. We are the ambassadors of him. We go before him into the world as though God were making his appeal or sharing his message through us because he is. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. When Christ changes our lives and gives us forgiveness and a future in heaven, he also changes our perspective on this life. And he gives us the purpose, and it looks different for different people. We have different backgrounds. We have different gifts, but the same purpose. We have the, the purpose of sharing the message of Jesus, of reconciliation with the world. And so here's what I want you to know. I don't care what your job is. I don't care if you're feeling fulfilled at work or fulfilled at a, as a mom or a dad. I, I want you to embrace this today and take it home with you. It's our first fill-in, that God has an amazing calling on your life. You, right now, have an amazing calling on your life. I don't care how mundane you think your life is or how uninteresting you think your life is. You're probably not going to be known 150 years from now like Albert Nobel. Who cares? You have an amazing calling on your life. And as we get into chapter 3 of Jonah, um, we're going to see a little bit more about that calling as we look at what happens with Jonah. So before we get into chapter three, just a little bit of background as to where we've been. We're going to make this real quick because I know many of you were here for parts one and two, but not all of you were. So you saw this map last week. And in week one, in chapter one, um, God called Jonah, who was in Joppa, to go to Nineveh, a heathen uh, violent people, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, and to share a message from God with the Ninevites. Jonah said, no, I'm not going. And in fact, decided to not just stay in Joppa, but actually to, well, as we talked, he was a runaway, go the exact opposite direction, 2,500 miles to Tarshish, okay? While he was sailing towards Tarshish, God sent a storm on the ship. And one of the things we looked at last week is that this was not because God wanted 
to get back at him. It was so that God would bring him back. And it, the storm was so violent that finally the sailors and Jonah himself had, had all decided that they had to do something about Jonah or otherwise the ship would shipwreck. And so they threw Jonah overboard. And last week in chapter two, we, we read like some of what Jonah's thoughts were as it seems as if he had even been sinking into the depths of the Mediterranean Sea to drown when God provided what? A big fish, right? Uh, uh, God provided a fish. It might have been a natural occurrence. Most likely, I think it was a miracle. God sent this fish that swallowed Jonah alive but didn't kill him. Jonah used it as a timeout, <laughs> and he thought about his life, and he repented, and even there was grateful praise that he talks about while in the, the belly of that fish, and then the fish uh, spit him out, or as the English translation says, vomited Jonah on the dry land. And that's where we pick it up in chapter three. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah again, or a second time. It's the same calling. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And I just want to stop there and I want us to marvel at the patience and the grace of God. Because God could have said, Jonah, you screwed up. I'm done with you. God could have sent someone else. God doesn't need Jonah. God can do anything he wants. God could have decided that he was done with him. But instead, God gave him a second chance. And I want you to realize something about God that's not just true for Jonah. It's true for you, and it's true for me as well. Um, and we'll start with what it's true for Jonah. Jonah's past did not disqualify him from God's calling. And that's very important for us to remember. Because Jonah is not the only one with a story of the past that if people knew all of it might be a little embarrassing. You may never have ended up in the newspaper or the news for something, <laughs> but what if, what if the people you loved knew everything you thought about them at every moment? As you think about your past story, as you think about your past, there most definitely are, are things that we wish we would have said differently or not said at all. There are things we wish we would have done differently. I don't know everyone in the room or online, but here's what I do know. You have a story. And some of it is a little embarrassing. Some of it, if they wrote, wrote a book about it and put it in the Bible, we'd be called a runaway. And not only do you have a story, so do I. I have things in, in my past that I'm embarrassed about. I have said things that I wish I could take back. I've reacted in certain ways in, in my marriage at times where it was not healthy. And it's not what not only a pastor should act like, but not, not what a follower of Christ should look like or act like. See, not only does Jonah's past not disqualify him from God's calling, it's also true that your past does not disqualify you from God's calling on your life. And I think this becomes even more clear um, when you look through the Bible and you see how many, <laughs> I'll say screwed up people, <laughs> God used for big purposes like pretty much everybody had a past and a story, not just Jonah. And you think of Abraham, how much time do we have? He was an adulterer, that's one thing. And yet God called him to be the father of the Jewish nation. <laughs> big role, big job. 
Um, Moses, he was a murderer. God called him to be one of the, the greatest leaders in the Old Testament and led God's people out of Egypt. Fast forward to the New Testament, Peter. Peter, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, was a guy who, while Jesus was on trial and hours away from being crucified, Peter was such a chicken that he used swear words to declare that he didn't even know Jesus. And God called him to be one of the most influential leaders of the early Christian church. Can you believe that? Or how about Paul? Maybe one of the most colored pasts of all, where he spent the first part of his life rounding up Christians, persecuting them, and having many of them murdered or killed, executed. And God called him to be one of the the greatest missionaries, Christian missionaries, maybe the greatest the world has ever seen. Your past does not disqualify you from the calling that God has on your life to go and to share and be an ambassador of him. In fact, your story, and as you look at these people's lives, is the very thing many times that you needed in order to better prepare you and get you ready for the calling that God has on your life. It, it, it helped mature you. It helped focus you. It opened doors for you. You know, this is true for Jonah as well. Um, there's this verse that Jesus speaks in. Uh, it's recorded in Luke 11, where he, he references how when Jonah showed up, it was a sign to the Ninevites that, that his presence brought an authority to the Ninevites. You know why that was? Because somehow, maybe Jonah told them, the Ninevites knew or heard that Jonah had been in the belly of a fish for three days and then had, had lived to tell about it. If someone had, you knew, just experienced that and then said they had a message from the Lord, um, I think our ears would perk up just a little bit more. And that was true for the Ninevites as well. Number three. Your story, okay, I, I, I don't know what your story is, but I want you to know it is not an obstacle to God's grace. It is a vehicle for God's grace. It is a vehicle for sharing God's grace. What do I mean by that? Well, sometimes we can talk about the love of Jesus with people in a very general way, and that's okay. God so loved the world. But one of the best instruments for sharing the gospel is your story. Not just God loved the world, but sharing how did God, how have you seen God's love for you? What difference has Christ made in your life? And to get very personal with that story can be such a great, as we said, vehicle for God's grace. Or how about this? And I've seen this in my own life. The the valleys you've gone through, the things that you've experienced, as difficult as they might be, allows you a better understanding or empathy for people who go through that same thing. And now all of a sudden, your story, as much as you would never have chosen whatever it is, becomes a vehicle to better understand what others are going through and to be able to better share the grace and love of God. Your story is this amazing vehicle for sharing God's grace and love. We all have stories. There's only one person that God's used in the history of the world that had no story in the sense of was a perfect person. And his name was Jesus. He was the son of God. Everyone else was screwed up in one way or another, was sinful, had a past. And God uses them because God is a God of second chances. You have a God of second chances. And we see that as he calls Jonah a second time. Verse three, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. He didn't go to Tarshish. He now went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. Um, some historians estimate somewhere between 400 and 500,000 people in the city and the surrounding area. It took three days to go through it. 
Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. You know, I think we need to just recognize, and we've talked about this, it's easy to pile on Jonah and to think like, you should have just listened to God and gone to Nineveh in the first place. What is wrong with you, right? But to forget what we've talked about of just not only what a difficult place it was that Jonah was being called to, but now we see what a difficult message Jonah was called to share with a very difficult people. It wasn't like, hey, guys, I'm, I'm bringing food and gifts. In the name of God, Yahweh. <laughs> That's a little bit of an easier message. It wasn't like, God thinks you're great right now, the way you're acting. Just wanted to tell you that. <laughs> it was to a people that had the reputation for beheading, skinning alive, and killing you, 40 more days, if you don't shape up, your city is going to be destroyed. Jonah was called by God to share a message that I think, to say it nicely, was uncomfortable. Now, we don't have the exact same message as Jonah, like 40 more days and Lakeville will be destroyed, you know, thankfully. But our message is this. It's our mission statement, really. We are here to lead people to Jesus. Our message is ultimately to lead people to the reality that there is a Savior who has taken care of their sin by dying in their place, that we have a a Savior God who has, as we talked about before, has allowed us to be reconciled with the Father, that when it comes to the future, because of Jesus Christ, we have nothing to fear, but we have a heavenly home to look forward to. I mean, it's an amazing message. But at the very same time, sometimes, just want you to know, when you're called to be a messenger of this message, that sometimes it'll lead to uncomfortable messages. And we need to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Like, what do you mean, Ben? Well, well how, how about this message? Your life is not your own, and it's not yours to do whatever you want with. Whew. How does that go over in our culture? How about this? How does that go over in your, in your heart? <laughs> that there is a God who has the right to direct what your life should be about because he created you? <laughs> That's an uncomfortable message. Or, or how about this one? There is a standard of right and wrong. <laughs> Like, there is an objective standard of right and wrong. There is truth and there is not truth. And the truth is not whatever you want truth to be in your own life. (laughs) Truth is what God says is truth. That's an uncomfortable message. And it's not just the world that doesn't want to hear this. Sometimes we don't want to hear this because we have ideas of what we want to do and where we want to put our focus and how we want to live. And it's uncomfortable, isn't it? That there is a standard of right and wrong. How about this one? All roads don't lead to heaven. That there is only one way to eternity. <laughs> And that his name is Jesus. And he is the way and the truth and the life. And that can be uncomfortable. Number three, we are called to share truth even if at times it can be uncomfortable. You know, um, sometimes being uncomfortable is exactly what people need 
to get them to change or to move from something. In fact, even secular people, or in this case, government officials know this. I was, I was doing a little bit of reading this week. And um, in places like Florida, where uh, the government is trying to, or you know, government officials are trying to get people to evacuate for a hurricane, let's say, what doesn't work very well is like uh, internet or radio announcements that a hurricane is coming, please evacuate. Some people go, but not as many as what they would like. And so government officials have figured out that sometimes they have to make people uncomfortable in order to, to go. Uh, one example of this, in 2012, Hurricane Sandy uh, was uh, going to be hitting Florida. And in some neighborhoods where it was really dangerous, um, some people went door to door and they would knock on the door and if someone was still there, they would hand them a Sharpie and ask them to write their social security number on their arms and they would say, because if you die and we come across your body, we want to know who you are. Do you think that was an easy message? <laughs> it's a little uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, the message was this. If you stay here, it's not going to be okay. And that sometimes is exactly what people need to hear. Sometimes we need to hear an uncomfortable message of truth because if we stay where we're at, it's not going to be okay. Sometimes the people around us, and as, as parents, we know this intuitively with our children. I think when it's peer-to-peer -peer or with adults, it gets a little bit more difficult, right? But sometimes we need to recognize that if they stay there, it's not going to be okay. Sometimes, you can go ahead, sometimes we need to share an uncomfortable message. And here's the thing, Christian church, we don't need to be jerks about it. We don't need to just, you know, come off as prideful and arrogant I have found when you have a relationship with someone, it's better or easier than, you know, knocking on a door with a Sharpie. But even then, it's not easy. And even then, it's so important to share truth. Jonah was called to share a very difficult message. 40 more days, Nineveh, you'll be destroyed. Because there was a hope that they would not stay where they're at. Well, what happened? Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites chopped off his head. The Ninevites kicked them out. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. These were outward signs of an inward change. Verse 6. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation then he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. This is the greatest miracle in the book of Jonah. Not a fish swallowing one guy. That's a miracle. But that four to 500,000 people had their attention caught and changed their ways, changed what they were doing, 
and what it sounds like came to repentance and an understanding of the true God. This, did you know, in the book of Jonah is the greatest, I'll use the word, revival in the entire Bible, not Pentecost, although that was great. 3,000 people on Pentecost. This was more than 10 times Pentecost. And you might be wondering, how in all the world would that happen? Well, I do think there is a couple human factors to think about. One, history tells us that at this time for Nineveh and Assyria, there were some neighboring enemies that were beginning to threaten them, which always catches people's attention, right? If you're being threatened. Uh, Also, history tells us that there were some plagues at the time that were killing people by the thousands. That too tends to have people think towards God and their relationship with God. Jonah shows up after just being, you know, vomited from a fish. Okay, I'm going to listen to this guy. (laughs) But ultimately, you know what the biggest factor was? It's a factor that's still around today. The Holy Spirit. That when we share a message When we share the gospel, when we talk to people about Jesus and about grace and sometimes uncomfortable messages of truth, that God the Holy Spirit works through it. Um, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, he wrote, no one can say or no one can come to faith that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. No one can say Jesus is Lord except through the Holy Spirit's work. And do you know what that means? Number four, it means that your role is to share, but God's role is to save. Your role is to just share what you know, share Jesus. God's role is through the Holy Spirit to make it work. And, you know, even as a pastor, that gives me great peace and comfort because I try uh, as hard as I can every single week to, to make God's word make sense to all of you, to share it in its truth and in, in also application. But there's some weeks where I do a better job at that than others. But every week, you know what is true? The Holy Spirit works. Because it's not about a preacher and it's not about a, a great you know, lay person who just has the right eloquent words. I do think thinking about what you say before you say it can always be helpful. Um, That's some marriage advice as well. You know, think about what you say before you say it. Thinking about what you say is always a good thing before you say it, but it is the Holy Spirit that works through it. I know that life can sometimes feel a little mundane. I know that some of you are in a season right now where work is, eh, it's just, it's paying the bills or you're at home with the kids every day and uh, I love them to death, but it's hard some days. There is an amazing calling that God has on your life, no matter where you're at or what you're doing. And so the question as we leave is this. Jonah was called to Nineveh. Where do you need to go? Who do you need to talk to? Where is God right now calling you to go? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that when we came to faith, that not only was our eternity changed, uh, but also you give us a renewed purpose for our lives right now. And Lord, I I hope and pray that that through Jonah's life and through the message today that we have a renewed sense of there is purpose in whatever season we're in and that there are opportunities all around us. And and help us wrestle with that question of, of where are we being called right now? And I would challenge us outside of the walls of our home to go and to share Jesus ultimately even sometimes when that also lends itself to uncomfortable messages. Lord, you are calling us today, just like you did Jonah. And today, by God's, your power and strength, may we reply, Lord, I'm ready. Send me. 
May we go forward, not with pressure on ourselves, but with the strength that you give with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm ready. Send me. And may you bless that work. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.